the Joe Rogan experience. But one of the most pressing things, one of the reasons why I wanted to bring you in, because you are very knowledgeable in all things space, is the James Webb telescope and uh, all the different stuff that they've been finding, particularly about these galaxies that were formed very shortly after, the, not shortly, you know, yeah. not within our, our lifetime shortly, but right. cosmologically shortly after the Big Bang that uh, it seems like we have to figure out why these things are forming. Is the universe older? There's all this different kind of speculation. Maybe the Big Bang is not 13 point whatever billion years old, but maybe 22, 24. Like what, what is your take on all this? Yeah, the, the James Webb Space, Space Telescope is such an incredible instrument. The data has just blown us away. You know, when you build this thing and you look at it and unfolding in space, you think there's so many ways it could go wrong that we all were just like, you know, this thing was 215 moving parts or something had to unfold. So, you know, just the fact in that In space. It, yeah. The fact it just all worked was just remarkable. Right. And then when we got those first images, they just kind of blew us away as well because we had sort of these engineering expectations of what it would do, but the data was just even better than that. So when it, you know, of course, the first thing you want to do is point it to the most distant part of the universe and see what's out there in those darkest patches. And so when it did that, yeah, it started finding a couple of things. It started finding quasars, which are kind of the, uh, the center of these very active gal galaxies. These are supermassive black holes that have loads of crap falling in, and they're spewing out all this energy. They're kind of feeding supermassive black holes. And so we started detecting those way earlier than we thought the universe should be able to build them. Because to make a supermassive black hole, I mean, these things are like a 100 million solar masses. Imagine that, 100 million suns have, have not only been born, but died, gone through their entire life cycle, died, collapsed into a black hole, and then those black holes have presumably somehow merged together into this super behemoth of this 100 million solar mass thing. So we're finding those just, you know, 300 million years after the Big Bang. And that, that was like, hold on, that, that doesn't make any sense. Like, how, how can this be? And similarly with the, uh, with the galaxies, we were seeing these images, these galaxies, and you can date roughly how old they should be based off the redshift. So the you know the universe is expanding. So therefore, if something is very far away from us and the universe is expanding, its light gets stretched more and more and more as it journeys over space. And so we can use that redshift to kind of date how old these things are. When we use those dates, we look at these images. Again, they seem suspiciously too too old. You know, you really shouldn't be able to form these things that, that early on in the universe. And so that kind of puzzled us. Um, I think for the galaxy thing, there was a bit of a resolution there. One of the uh, resolutions is that we probably um, miscalculated how, how easy it is to form these galaxies in the first place. So we had these models for galaxy formation. We had these models for how stars should form, how quickly they should live. But it was all essentially calibrated on what we see around us, like right here in this part of the universe, in the local universe. And then we kind of realized that those same models probably need to be tweaked if you're going to apply them to the early universe, where the density is so much higher, the, the gas temperature is much hotter, everything's just you know, completely different in the early universe. So when you kind of make those corrections, it actually looks like maybe it's actually possible to make those galaxies earlier than we thought. So I think the galaxy problem is a bit easier to explain. I think the quasar problem to me is more interesting. How do you get those supermassive black holes so early? Um, there's a certain kind of maximum rate you can feed these things called the Eddington limit. And that's sort of you throw mass into a black hole and so much energy is going in, some of it spews back out. And the energy which spews back out stops other stuff coming in. Right, so there's a maximum limit. You can't build a black hole faster in principle than this Eddington limit. And yet, when you do the calculation, these black holes must have been fed what we call super Eddington. So faster than Eddington. So something's wrong with our models, right? Either, either we've got the universe age wrong, which I think is possible, but I would say that's probably a much less likely solution, or we've got the astrophysics wrong. Why do you think that the universe's age is a less likely solution? Because we've got this, this you know, like in particle physics, you've got the standard model, which includes like all the particles and the electron, the baryons, all these kind of stuff. And in cosmology, we have a similar kind of model. It's called lambda CDM. And so the lambda stands for dark energy, and the CDM is cold dark matter. So this is our standard model, and we have used it to explain so much stuff in the universe, Joe. I mean, we're talking about the cosmic microwave background, um, oscillations in the sky, like these baryonic acoustic oscillations, the stretching in the universe, Cepheids. You can use it to explain so much stuff, and it works beautifully. I mean, it works down to like the 0.01% level. So 
if you say the universe age is wrong, you have to give that up. So maybe it is, maybe it is wrong, but if you give that up, you have to come up with a radical new idea, which can now explain all of this stuff at that same level of precision. The much more likely answer in my book is that astrophysics, like the you know gas swirling around, the plasma colliding with each other, that's just more complicated in my mind than the, the natural model of just the simple expansion of the universe, which actually is a fairly simple geometric model. Fairly simple in that you can use whatever methods that we're using currently to measure everything that's out there and it makes sense. Yeah. yeah. But if we're, la- if we're using something like the James Webb Telescope, so we're getting a much deeper view of the universe, how limited is the James Webb in comparison to James Webb 2.0, 3.0? Like, are yeah. we going to have to continually revamp what our, our understanding of this process is? Yes, we will. And that, that's, that's, what, exciting. That, that's what I love, right? That's that what great? scientists love. Every, every time we've built a telescope that is you know, uh, 10 times more precise than the last thing, Every time we've done that, we have been surprised. And so these early galaxies are a good example. Um, the cosmological experiments that are going on now, one of the big like surprises is this thing called the Hubble tension. Have you heard of that, Hubble no. tension? So Hubble tension is measuring the expansion rate of the universe. How fast are things flying apart? And you can do it two ways. You can use the uh, cosmic microwave backgrounds. That's the earliest radiation that we can detect. This is that stuff that's about three Kelvin warm. You can detect in the microwave. And this is the light which has traveled basically when the universe was 380,000 years old. It's that light and we see it in all directions. That's how we know the Big Bang kind of didn't happen in one place. It happened everywhere because you just see this light coming in from all directions. And from studying that, that radiation, you can, you can kind of get a model of the universe and then you can calculate using this model, how fast should the universe be expanding today if I run the clock forward? And you get a number. And then if you do that same experiment, but locally, you actually measure the stars. You measure the supernovae around us, these pulsating stars, and you actually measure how fast this stuff expanding, you get a different number. They don't line up. And so this is really weird. So somehow something's wrong, right? Either our measurements of the local universe must be wrong in some way, or this model that we're using to calculate the whole history of the universe, something is wrong with that model. So this is a very famous growing problem in cosmology. It's now what we call a five sigma level. So that means the chance of this being random is just like zero essentially. It's just, this, this is a real effect. And now we just have to figure out who's wrong. Is it the observers or is it the theorists? Wow. Where, do you, where do you fall on this? <sighs> yeah, it's hard. I'm, I go, I swing between both ways, you know. I'll talk to my cosmology colleagues and they'll, you know, depending on who I talk to, they'll convince me either way. Um, so I think the, that's disturbing that people are convinced, (laughs) you know, if it's, if if these new telescopes keep showing us this new puzzle, it's kind of, it always bothers me when someone is like rigidly convinced. Everyone has a certain pet theory, right? They're trying to push. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we all have biases, right? Yeah. So human beings. Yeah. I mean, if you've spent, it's hard, right? If you've spent 20 years of your life, you know, most of your academic career studying this one thing. It's really hard to turn around and say, you know what, I screwed up, right? The last 20 years of measurements, they were all wrong, and I have to eat humble pie. That's not easy, but it has happened in some cases. One of my fav- favorite stories about this is uh, the, fir- the first exoplanet that was ever claimed, a planet around another star, uh, one of the first ones. It was um, wrong. So it was, it was a, a pulsar that had a planet, a supposed planet around it on a six month orbital period. So exactly half the Earth's orbital period around the sun. And they saw this signal in their data, this, this pulsating star was doing something weird, and they figured out there was a six-month period around it. So the, the dude published this paper, um, Matthew Bales, brilliant astronomer, and he realized later on it was wrong. And instead of it being a real planet, he hadn't quite corrected the orbital eccentricity of the Earth. So the Earth is not on a circular orbit. Its eccentricity is 0. 0.0167. It's a tiny number. But that number hadn't been accounted for in the calculation. And so he had to stand up in front of hundreds of astronomers at this famous IAU meeting, and he admitted he was wrong. And he got a standing ovation. Oh, for good doing. for him. It's yeah. awesome. It's one of the few times I've heard someone doing that. And I think it's dope. I think we need to encourage people to Well, with something that. that's so massive and is such a puzzle, this is just bound to happen. Yeah. If you get people that are rigidly attached to their belief systems, in, in terms of like 
a very limited understanding of a fantastic thing that is almost beyond imagination. When you think about the, yeah. the, the sheer size of the universe and the age of the universe. I mean, when we're talking about aging and we say 13 billion or 22 billion, th those numbers don't even register in your mind. They're not real. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like that you see a one and a three and you kind of get it, but you don't get it. There's you can, no you way. You can't intuit it. No. Yeah. Yeah. It's not possible for our puny little minds to imagine 13 plus billion years. It's just too crazy. So if you're rigid with that, like, God, man. Yeah. Like... I mean, part of the journey of being a scientist is, is knowing what your own biases are. And I, I remember, you know, one of my threads of my career has been trying to look for exomoons, moons around these exoplanets, which would be a first if we got them. So, that's, you know, it's a big deal, right? You know, if I succeed at this, it could be like, you know, golden prizes, award ceremonies. Like, you, you kind of get that glimmer in your eye, like, oh, man, this could, like, I could be memorialized for this <laughs> success. And so that's, that's alluring, right? That's tempting. Mm -hmm. It's like it's kind of the same temptation as fame. And I remember once we had this signal, uh, it was Kepler 90, uh, no, PH2b was the name of the planet. And we had this signal and it kind of looked like just what we expect for an exomoon. And I remember I was so excited. I had to, I was at Harvard at the time, had to walk out the building, had to go to a park bench and I had to just take like deep breaths. I was like, <laughs> this, this could be it, you know, this is the thing I've been searching for. That's and awesome. I was like almost hyperventilating with, wow. with excitement. And then I remember in that That's moment. That's how you know you're in the right job. Right. Right? I, yeah. The like passion that is was the there job for, for sure. you. Yeah. And I remember thinking to myself after calming myself down a little bit, I want this to be true too much. Mm. You know, like this is of all the people in the world, I want this to be true the most. So therefore, let's flip that round. And I'm going to have to be the greatest skeptic of this thing because I know I want it to be so bad that I have to correct the other direction. And it ended up being bullshit. I mean, it ended up being uh, the telescope just misbehaved, had this weird effect uh, called a sudden pixel dropout effect. This weird anomaly happens one in like 100,000 times, but it just so happened to pop right then, right there in my uh, data. What do we know about the consistency of solar systems and galaxies being formed? We know they vary in size. Do we understand why, and we understand what causes them to form in the first place? Yeah, we're still learning that. The you know we had this picture before we started finding exoplanets that everything would just be like the solar system. And you know, we have these these eight planets, circular orbits. You have the rocky planets on the inside, the gas giants on the outside, and we came up with this really elegant theory, this kind of nebula theory, to try and explain that, and did a great job explaining everything. But then as soon as we started finding exoplanets, I mean, one of the first type of exoplanets we found was these hot Jupiters. So these are Jupiter-sized planets, which are about 20 times closer to their star than Mercury is around the sun. And when those were first announced, nobody believed them. People were like, you can't, you can't get a Jupiter there. Like, Jupiter's supposed to be 5 AU. How do you get it parked on, almost onto the surface of the star? It doesn't make any sense. No, none of the planet formation models could explain that. And it took until we found about 10 of them in a row that people started slowly changing their minds. And the proof of the pudding was when one of them eclipsed its star. So one of them actually passed right in front of the star, oh. right at the moment it was supposed to, and we saw an eclipse. And when that happened, everyone was like, all right, this is, this is real. But then we had to figure out how the hell do you do that? So there was, a long, there was a long skeptical curve to get to that point. And now we think the way to make those things is there's probably Jupiters on the outside of the solar system. They come too close to each other. They gravitation, like kind of wrestling almost. They kind of excite each other. One of them gets kicked out in a random direction and it can get flung into a highly eccentric orbit. And a highly eccentric orbit over time will circularize. So it doesn't want to stay on an eccentric orbit. It wants to turn into a circle through the tidal interactions with the star. So these things probably circularize really close onto their stars. But this is unusual. It only happens about 1% of star systems. We see this. But it's an example of how diverse things are. Um, another example is mini Neptunes. You ever heard of those planets? No. So mini Neptunes are these planets which are in between the size of the Earth and Neptune. Neptune's about four times bigger than the Earth. So these things are about twice the size of the Earth. We don't have anything like that in the solar system. So we don't know what it is. Is it a big rock? Is it like a super Earth, a mega Earth? Or is it a scaled down version of Neptune? Is it like an ocean world maybe of some kind? And turns out that planet is the most common type of planet in the universe, as far as we can tell. And we don't have one. Wow. So that's kind of weird, right? I mean, it seems like there's so many aspects of our solar system that are unusual. 
even having a Jupiter, only 10% of stars have a Jupiter. 